Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, second Wing Hatton Lecture 2015. We are very grateful for your coming to this lecture tonight. We know how difficult it is for people, especially who have to work downtown. My name is Terry Khan. I'm the co-director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Law, together with uh, Dr. Philip Bay. Uh, Philip? Yes, that's Philip. <coughs> Well, we're very pleased to have with us um, <clears throat> this evening the President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong, Professor Peter Mattison, um, and uh, his wife, Dr. Christina Mattison. Um, <clears throat> we are especially grateful because uh, they uh, did a sprint, more or less literally, from the Hong Kong uh, Convention and Exhibition Center in Wan Chai, where they had presided over a graduation ceremony for the Faculty of uh, Business and Economics. And of course, today we <clears throat> also have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Professor Tim Lewins, who I will introduce to you a little later. But first, if I might just invite the President and Vice-Chancellor up to say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Terry. Yes, I was, I was expected to be here at the end to say thank you. Uh, I wasn't expected to be here at the beginning to say welcome, so it's a great pleasure that, to do that. And I'm grateful to the Faculty of Business and Economics for an extremely efficient graduation ceremony, which allows me to do that. Um, so uh, yes, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, our speaker. And, and you're going to introduce more about, about Tim, about the Professor of Philosophy of Science, and indeed about the subject. Um, as, as many of you know, I'm a medic myself, and my wife is a dentist. But actually, our family reason for being interested in this topic is nothing to do with my profession or my wife's profession. Uh, I was just, just explaining to, uh, to Tim that we have a daughter uh, who is affected by a genetic disorder. Um, uh, and she's very interested in how she might uh, decide whether or not any offspring that she has would be affected or not by this disorder. So this topic actually is, is one of great family interest to the Mathesons, and, and, uh, and that's another reason why I'm pleased to be here at the beginning and not at the end, because I hope I'll learn something. My daughter knows more about this topic than I do. But, um, so I just really want to say thank you to the Wing Foundation and the Hatton Trust. We've got Anthony and Juliet here. We've got Ron and Penny. Uh, respectively, uh, Anthony and, and Ron represent the Wing Foundation and the Hatton Trust, and they're behind the sponsorship of um, this lecture and indeed of the link between Hong Kong U and Cambridge in medical ethics and law. Um, I'm very keen on links between Hong Kong U and Cambridge. It's nothing to do with the fact with where I got my PhD. Uh, I'm, I'm totally independent. I do realize there's another university in Oxford. Um, but actually, Cambridge uh, and Hong Kong, you have a number of, of links, a number of growing links. And, and I'm very keen to uh, see this one. That this is now the second uh, manifestation of the, the Wing Hatton Lecture. So um, Tim, you're very welcome to Hong Kong uh, and to the University of Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Anthony and Ron, for the support. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I'm looking forward to learning something that I can then tell my daughter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mattison. Um, <clears throat> our speaker for the evening is uh, Professor Tim Lewins, and his title is uh, The Ethics of Reproductive Technologies, Some Tools for Thinking. Well, Professor Lewins is Professor of um, the Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge and a former member of the Nuffil Council on Bioethics. His recent books include The Biological Foundations of Bioethics, which is published by Oxford University, uh, University Press 2015, uh, Cultural Revolution, Evolution, Conceptual Challenges, also by OUP 2015, and The Meaning of Science, Penguin 2015. Now, this last book, as he found out, is prominently displayed in our own HKU bookstore. So if they haven't closed yet, you could avail yourself of a copy. <clears throat> but he tells me there are only two left. Um, his research has focused on a variety of issues in philosophy and the life sciences, including genetics and justice, the rights and wrongs of efforts to enhance the human species, the application of evolutionary, theori uh, evolutionary theorizing to cultural change, and the moral significance of quotation marks again, human nature. Well, <clears throat> last year, for the first Wing Hatton Lecture, 
we had as our guest uh, Professor John Spencer, also from the University of Cambridge. He was a legal expert, and his particular interest was in criminology and jurisprudence. Now, there are many conferences um, in the worlds of law and medicine relating to the latest developments <clears throat> in the medical sciences, and uh, one particular area that's attracted a lot of attention recently is the reproductive technologies. They're now um, becoming real possibilities. So things like uh, mitochondrial um, <clears throat> transfer or genome editing has uh, come into the news and caused quite a lot of controversy. But I think there's been far less attention paid to some very fundamental questions um, <clears throat> from the philosophical and the moral perspectives. Basic questions like, um, <clears throat> what is ultimately the end, ends of uh, this kind of technology? Are these technologies necessarily unmitigated good? Are there times and other instances and circumstances that we should stop uh, or, or we should be careful about um, <clears throat> taking further steps? Professor Lewins's uh, <clears throat> talk is um, um, one in uh, a series of <clears throat> lectures and conferences that the Center for uh, Medical Ethics and Law is holding uh, this year and the next two years on, uh, the sim on similar themes. The <clears throat> we want to um, <clears throat> um, look into questions uh, of how the law <clears throat> interacts with um, <clears throat> medicine in the field of uh, developing technologies and likewise uh, the body of ethics. So following this uh, lecture, you will have uh, next uh, Friday a talk on um, regulating biomedical research. Just on Friday at lunchtime, 27 November. You probably have a flyer already. And in April next year on 7 and 8, very carefully on Thursday and Friday so as not to um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> clash with the rugby sevens. Um, <clears throat> we're having a joint conference with the Cambridge Center for Law, Medicine and the Life Sciences uh, on the topic of the legal and ethical implications of personalized medicine and precision medicine. Um, so that will see a gathering of international experts in the fields of uh, law, philosophy, and medicine, uh, gathering in Hong Kong uh, from all the major jurisdictions to thresh out the issues. If you're interested in this conference, please do let me or any of the uh, <clears throat> officers outside know. So I think I will leave Prof. Lewins to explain to you what he's going to talk about. And without further ado, shall we welcome Professor Tim Lewins. I'll just uh, get my slides sorted out. This one's that one, isn't it? I should say that um, I'm used to lecturing to audiences of students in Cambridge who never clap like that at the beginning of the lecture. So thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, and actually, it occurs to me that in saying that, I've rather implied that they do clap at the end of the lecture, but they don't usually do that either. Um, OK, uh, I, I wanted to just begin by saying a few thank yous. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in Hong Kong. Uh, I've already been uh, enjoying myself, uh, seeing this, this beautiful island, eating plenty of the wonderful food that you have here as well. Um, I particularly, uh, as well as thanking you all for coming here, I wanted to thank HKU uh, in general. I wanted to thank the President Vice-Chancellor for, for being here this evening. And of course, also I wanted to thank uh, Ron and, and Anthony, uh, whose support via the, the Wing Foundation and the Hatton Trust uh, has, has obviously helped bring me here this evening. So, so thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, so for a very long time now, uh, we've had what you might think of as low-tech solutions to problems of childlessness. People can obviously adopt 
People can obviously enter into various informal kinds of surrogacy arrangement, for example. But also for a long time now, we've had what you might think of as much higher tech solutions to these problems. So in 1978, not that long ago, Louise Brown was born, the first so-called test tube baby, partly pioneered by researchers uh, working, working in Cambridge. And, and since then, we've seen uh, an enormous explosion in the, the, the abilities, the, the technical abilities and, and the practical abilities that people working in these areas have had. So as, as Terry mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, in February of, of this year, the UK was, I think, the first country in the world to make legal a new set of techniques that promise, perhaps, to eliminate the inheritance of certain kinds of mitochondrial diseases. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more in a minute. And since then, we've also found a fairly stormy and very interesting debate going on about the wisdom of a, a newer set of technologies, so-called genome editing technologies, which again promise a very high level of precision uh, in the way in which we can intervene in alter and perhaps correct uh, diseases of the genome. Now, what I want to do in, in the time I have today is think in various ways about what tools we have for thinking through the rights and the wrongs of these technologies. In the case of both mitochondrial donation and the genome editing technologies that I've mentioned, a lot of debate has focused on the question of whether it might be appropriate to intervene in the so-called human germline. Now, one of the things that I want to ask is, what do we even mean when we talk about the germline? How is that notion of the germline used in policy discourse, in some areas of legal discourse, and in bioethical reasoning? And I'm going to suggest that there are two sets of reasons, partly actually based on recent scientific developments and partly based on ethical thinking, which suggests to me at least that the very notion of the germline is not one that has very much ethical usefulness anymore. Instead, I'm going to suggest that if we want to think better about these new technologies, we're better off if we focus on a mature understanding of the risks imposed by these technologies. And that means that we then need tools for thinking in a responsible way about risk, how to assess it, and how to manage it. I'm going to suggest that we need to find a plausible reading of the so-called precautionary principle. This has been an important tool in environmental reasoning, but it's also, I think, a potentially useful tool when we think about new health-related technologies as well, and yet it's been a tool that has proven rather hard to pin down. And I'm going to close the talk by suggesting that we also need to think maybe in new ways, maybe in ways that some people might find slightly uncomfortable, about the proper relationship between what many people think of as purely technical scientific issues about safety and efficacy and more broad ethical issues about social acceptability. And I'm going to try and suggest that we need to think of these sets of considerations as being much more closely linked than they often are. OK, so let me begin by just saying a little bit to you about mitochondrial disease and about the recent technologies that have been licensed in the UK. Mitochondria are small units, so-called organelles, they're found inside cells, but they're not found in the cell nucleus. They're found outside the nucleus in the cell cytoplasm. Now, many people assume that all of our genes are contained inside the nucleus, but it turns out that that's not the case. It turns out that a very small proportion of the total human genome is, in fact, housed within these so-called mitochondria, outside the cell nucleus. It's a small proportion, as you can see from the slide. It's probably only about 0.1% of the total human genome. They only contain around 37 genes. But although they're very small in number, defects in these mitochondrial genes can lead to serious diseases. Those diseases can be systemic. They can be progressive. They can often lead to severe disability. And they can also lead to, to early death. <clears throat> 
because of the fact that these genes are contained in mitochondria, rather than being contained in the nucleus, they follow a rather special kind of inheritance pattern. They're passed by mothers, but not by fathers, onto their children. And they're passed on to both male and female children. But males themselves even if they're affected by mitochondrial disease, cannot pass those mitochondrial diseases on to future generations. Now, I'm going to show you a slide that might lead you to panic because I know that you won't be able to read the text on it. That doesn't matter. It's the pictures that count. Um, OK, so what you see here is a, a, a diagram that um, was produced by the Nuffield Council on Bioethics illustrating one of these techniques that's recently been licensed in the UK, so-called pro-nuclear transfer. So assuming the pointer works. Um, so, so what we have here uh, is uh, an egg here from the mother affected by mitochondrial disease. Uh, these red dots are supposed to be her unhealthy mitochondria. Uh, sperm is used to fertilize the egg. And we then have the two so-called pronuclei, the nuclear material from the mother and the father together here. And these pronuclei are then taken and placed into a healthy, uh, a, a, a healthy embryo that derives from a, a woman who does not have uh, mitochondrial disease. And so what we have effectively here is a, a rehousing of the uh, intending mother's uh, healthy nuclear genome uh, inside uh, an embryo uh, that itself comes from another woman uh, and, and has uh, healthy mitochondria. And so the result of this technique works as expected, is that this woman who otherwise would have had children affected by mitochondrial disease will instead uh, have children free from mitochondrial disease, uh, but who nonetheless share her nuclear genes. Now, the, the second technique, so-called maternal spindle transfer, works in a, a very similar kind of way, but just at a slightly different stage of the process. Uh, so here again, uh, we now have a, an, an egg from the intending mother with the unhealthy mitochondria, the healthy nucleus. The, the so-called spindle of chromosomes that's found uh, inside this egg uh, is then removed, placed into an egg from a donor mother that has had its own spindle of chromosomes removed. So once again, we rehouse this healthy nuclear genetic material in an egg that's had its own nuclear material removed but has healthy mitochondria. And again, we that now use an IVF technique to fertilize the egg. And again, the idea is that the woman can go on to have perfectly healthy children, but who nonetheless uh, have a, a, a genetic link uh, to her. Now, these techniques are often referred to as mitochondrial donation techniques. Uh, Although this is in some ways not strictly relevant to the thrust of my argument, I just always feel the need to get off my chest that uh, the label mitochondrial donation is, I think, in some ways rather misleading. So as I've said, both of these techniques offer a valuable prospect, potentially valuable prospect, which is women can have healthy children who also share a, a nuclear genetic link. Why do I think mitochondrial donation is a misleading label? Well, if you go back, to both of these techniques, what you'll see is that the, the donor mother is not only donating mitochondria. The, the, the donor is donating, in fact, every structure bar the nuclear material. So one potential worry about even labeling these techniques as mitochondrial donation techniques is it rather gives the impression that the only thing that's being contributed by the donor mother, and even perhaps the only thing that we really need to worry about when it comes to risk assessment, is the effects of the mitochondria. But in fact, if you think that maybe other structures in the egg bar the nucleus may also have interesting roles in inheritance, then it might turn out, albeit this is at a, an early stage of, of scientific investigation, that in fact the, the donor mother contributes considerably more of importance to the overall process. So, so much for my worries about the use of this term mitochondrial donation. Um, OK, I'll return back to this case um, in a moment. <clears throat> so mitochondrial donation was made legal uh, at the beginning of, of the year in the UK. Um, we've also seen very lively debate 
about another set of technologies, so-called genome editing technologies. Now, I'm not going to describe these technologies in very much detail. It's not really relevant to, to what I want to talk about. Um, the most widely discussed technique, it's not the only technique of genome editing that people are working on, but this is the label that you'll hear most often in, in newspaper articles, is the so-called CRISP, uses the so-called CRISPR-Cas9 system. Now, these technologies do work on nuclear genes, they hold the promise, many scientists are very enthusiastic about them because they seem to offer much greater precision than we've had before when it comes to altering genomes in, perhaps in humans, but also in plants, in animals, in microorganisms. These genome editing technologies have many, many applications. They have applications in basic research. For example, one way in which researchers have standardly tried to figure out what role a gene has in development is to silence the gene, knock the gene out, remove the gene, and see how development proceeds under those altered circumstances. So one nice thing about these technologies is they potentially give you a much more precise way of targeting the genes that you want to knock out to see how development then works, and that might be in mice, it might be in, in anything you like. Industry is excited because these techniques potentially have roles in commercial breeding, and that might be in plants, that might be in yeast, it could be in, again, pretty much anything you like. In humans, people have got excited about these therapies because of their potential involvement in gene therapy. But genome editing might also be used potentially for modifying the human germline. And this is one of the reasons why these technologies have received a particularly large amount of attention from ethicists, from journalists, from groups of scientists, from many, many participants in these debates. And, and the thought goes that germline modification is something that we should be particularly worried about. Now, it's interesting that mitochondrial donation, the technology I talked about just before I mentioned genome editing, is already widely viewed as a form of germline modification. Why? Because a woman who would have had children affected by mitochondrial disease will instead have children hopefully free from those diseases and also grandchildren free from those diseases and also great-grandchildren free from those diseases. One of the reasons why these technologies attracted so much ethical debate in the UK was precisely because they were viewed not by everybody but by many people as instances of germline modification. And germline modification, germline interventions, have a bad moral smell about them. Many, many groups have lined up to indicate that for some reason or another, germline modification is something that should be condemned. So here's a fairly clear early example that comes from UNESCO, from their so-called Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights, back from uh, 1997. And UNESCO worried that perhaps these germline interventions, as it put it, could be contrary to human dignity. And the CRISPR technologies that I mentioned have also been subject to similar forms of ethical opprobrium, which have drawn on these worries again about germline intervention. So here, and, and you'll see there's a whole string of these kinds of worries that have been aired uh, over the last few months. So, so back in March, a group of, uh, of scientists who were working with these technologies uh, expressed their own worries about how they should be used. Many, they say, oppose germline modification on the grounds that permitting even unambiguously therapeutic innovations could start us down a path towards non-therapeutic genetic enhancement. We share these concerns, and that was in a piece called Don't Edit the Human Germline. You'll also see that in the United States, the NIH, which is uh, probably the major uh, federal funder of health research uh, in, in the US, uh, the NIH said in April of this year that it wouldn't be funding any work on genome editing technologies if that was looking at their effects on human embryos. And again, why were they worried about it? Well, again, they drew on these considerations about germline modification. So here's what the NIH said. The concept of altering the human germline in embryos for clinical purposes has been debated over many years from many different perspectives and has been viewed almost universally as a line that should not be crossed. 
Advances in technology have given us an elegant new way of carrying out genome editing, but the strong arguments against engaging in this activity remain. So once again, we have this very important group saying, don't mess with the germline. So what is the germline? And why exactly are we not supposed to cross it? Now, it's interesting that um, different groups of people, it turns out, although everybody blithely discusses the morality of the germline, different groups of people, often they don't define what they mean by the germline, or when they do explicitly define it, they define it in actually ways which are very, very different from, from one group to another. And that might make you worry if it's supposed to be such an important ethical boundary. It, it would also appear important to know where that line is supposed to be drawn. So for many biologists, the germline picks out a lineage descending through the generations of so-called germ cells. Well, that's not very helpful. Which ones are the germ cells? So some biologists, often people specializing in particular areas of developmental biology, have a very particular definition of what they understand a germ cell to be. A germ cell is a certain specialized kind of cell that has the role of producing gametes, maybe eggs, maybe sperm. Now that's an interesting definition and it's very important in some contexts. It's not so helpful if instead we want to apply it to these ethical debates, because after all, if the germ cells are merely the specialized cells producing gametes, then it's going to turn out that gametes themselves won't count as germ cells. It's also going to turn out, strangely enough, because very early cells in human embryos are not specialized for any role at all, those very early cells won't count as germ cells on this strict definition either. And yet, all the ethical debate is precisely about whether or not we should intervene in very early embryos or in gametes and eggs. And so, although this is a perfectly reasonable definition for certain technical purposes, it doesn't seem to be one that does that much help if we want to make sense of these ethical and policy issues. I think it's for that reason that we sometimes find the very idea of the germline defined in different ways. So, the International Society for Stem Cell Research, and this is a definition that they produce not in a scientific context, but precisely in a context of their thoughts about the politics and ethics of genome editing. They tell us that germ cells are the cells that carry inheritable germline DNA. Now, because the DNA of sperm cells, egg cells, and early cells and embryos is indeed inheritable, or at least potentially inheritable under the right circumstances, these will indeed be reinstated as elements of the germline. This definition, I think, and I said earlier on that I wasn't going to talk about history here, but somehow or another some history has inserted itself into my talk. Um, I think this definition in some ways is reminiscent of the way in which August Weismann, a 19th century biologist, thought about the so-called uh, germ plasm. And Weismann thought of the germ plasm as material contained inside a cell, and Weismann uh, eventually took the view that this material was indeed all contained inside the cell nucleus, and we've already seen reason for doubting that from the mitochondrial case. Weismann thought that this was the material that had responsibility for ensuring the inheritance of features, had responsibility for ensuring parent-offspring relationships. Uh, and so it looks as though what the International Society for Stem Cell Research is doing is giving a kind of more up-to-date account of what Weissman thought he was doing by talking about the germplasm. And sure enough, this is exactly the kind of definition that we find when we look to that great authority on matters definitional, the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, the OED says that the germplasm is, quote, the physical substance responsible for the transfer of inherited traits from one generation to the next. And then it simply goes on and says, genetic material later identified as DNA. Now, you might wonder there whether the OED has been a little bit hasty. The OED is effectively saying here, and of course the OED shouldn't be thought of as a biological uh, authority, but the OED is effectively saying here, well, it's just obvious, isn't it, that the only physical substance that's responsible for the transfer of inherited traits from one generation to the next is genetic material, and we now know that that's just DNA. 
Isn't it just obvious that all inheritance ultimately boils down to what happens to DNA? And isn't that pretty much the reason why the International Society for Stem Cell Research simply goes ahead and identifies the germline with inheritable germline DNA? Well, it seems to me that there's a lot of interesting recent scientific work which undermines that thought that we can simply equate structures responsible for the inheritance of traits with DNA. And in fact, recent research suggests that the story is far more complicated than that. Um, and I think we should be worried about this because there's a form of what we might call DNAism a kind of peculiar focus on DNA at the exclusion of other molecules. Maybe other molecules should get some representation too. A form of DNAism underlies quite a lot of uh, legal regulation of reproductive technology. So let me just give you a quick example where you see DNA being singled out for special treatment in, in, in a piece of legislation. So uh, in the UK, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act is very specific about what kind of sperm and eggs may be used for reproductive purposes, particularly what you're allowed to do to sperm and eggs before you can place them in a woman's womb. Only so-called permitted eggs and sperm are allowed. So which ones are the permitted ones? Here's what they say about eggs and it's in bold because it's also in bold in the HFEA text. Uh, a permitted egg is one, A, which has been produced by or extracted from the ovaries of a woman. And that's to make sure that we don't use eggs which have been produced by or extracted from the ovaries of a, of a pig or a donkey. Uh, and B, whose nuclear or mitochondrial DNA has not been altered. And then, of course, there's an exception that says under certain circumstances, mitochondrial DNA can be altered. But note here, what are we not allowed to tamper with? DNA. It doesn't say anything about not tampering with other molecules. It doesn't explicitly prohibit any other uh, form of, of intervention. But we know already that not all inheritance can be explained by the inheritance of DNA. We know that there are other important structures, so-called epigenetic structures, epigenetic markers, which also play an important role in inheritance. So research is increasingly suggesting that DNA itself can be modified in its action by so-called methyl groups, these methylation patterns. DNA can be modified in this way by methylation patterns, and sometimes those modifications, which have nothing to do with the structure of DNA itself, but instead relate to these non-DNA molecules which attach to DNA, sometimes those features can be inherited across generations, and sometimes it's the inheritance of methylation patterns, which some groups of scientists at least increasingly think may be responsible for the inheritance of disease. So in other words, resemblance between parents and offspring is very often explained by the inheritance of DNA, but not always. Sometimes it's explained by other important molecules instead. <clears throat> now that should make us think, because after all, if it's true that epigenetic processes make a difference to inheritance. If it's true that these epigenetic processes are part of the matter, part of the molecules, part of the molecular basis that explains the inheritance of parental traits by their offspring, then it looks as though epigenetic processes should also fall within the scope of regulation that's intended to protect or safeguard interventions to the germline. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is that epigenetics itself, epigenetic processes, turns out to name an extraordinarily unruly collection of different forms of inheritance. Often people use the term epigenetic inheritance simply to mean any old inheritance mechanism, anything that helps explain parent-offspring resemblance, as long as it's not itself genetic or as long as it's not itself 
grounded in DNA. And so what that means is that the very notion of epigenetic inheritance implicates the methylation patterns, which I've already mentioned. It implicates shocks brought on by famine, because it turns out that if you are malnourished or undernourished during your life, then your children may be much more prone to obesity, and their children may also be much more prone to obesity, regardless of what actually happens to them during their early dietary phases. And this is often expressed as, as an epigenetic effect. Bacterial inoculation, so it turns out that it's actually rather good if you get a bit of a dose of your parents' gut bacteria as you're being born, because that improves various aspects of your digestion, and that itself is something which is then inherited in future generations. But of course, because epigenetic processes just mean all of those processes that help to explain parent-offspring resemblance brackets, but which aren't grounded in DNA or genes, it also means that the manifest fact that a lot of my traits are things which I inherit from my parents because I learnt it from them, such as the fact that I speak English reasonably fluently, for example, those two are often understood as epigenetic processes. And people who work on animal traditions and animal learning think of themselves as working on another set of epigenetic processes. And this clearly poses a problem. Because after all, if we're worried about intervening in the germline, but then we persuade ourselves that, oh, the germline, oh, it should probably include some of those epigenetic processes as well. Oh, but wait, hang on a minute. The epigenetic processes pretty much encompass anything, including social learning. Then all of a sudden, we'll convince ourselves that people shouldn't be allowed to teach their kids anything. Or at least they shouldn't be allowed to reflect on how they're teaching their kids. And that's probably a, a, a mistake. <clears throat> So whatever we do, it looks as though we've got to find some way of reining in what we mean by the germline. And I think that's going to turn out to be a very, very difficult problem. One way that you might hope to be able to do it is by distinguishing, so to speak, biological processes of inheritance, which you might say belong with the germline, from social processes of inheritance like learning or culture, which you might say belong somewhere else. Now, I, I'm worried about that. I think that there are some, uh, again, processes which are becoming increasingly well understood by scientists that even challenge the idea that we can easily divide up the cultural processes and the biological processes. So uh, mainly I'm going to talk about humans. This is my slide talking about rats. So there's a group uh, headed by a man called Michael Meany in the States. Uh, and, and here's what their group has found, uh, and here's what they suggest. So mother rats, uh, some of them lick their young. Some of them lick and groom their young a lot more than others. And for the rats that are particularly prone to licking their young, it seems as though by a very roundabout route, this actually makes a difference to the methylation patterns on their pups, uh, their baby rats' DNA. And because of this, it ends up in turn making a difference to how these pups respond to stress when they get older. And it turns out that those young pups are then actually more likely, if they've been licked a lot during their own rat youth, it turns out that they're also more likely to lick their young pups when they become big grown-up rats. So this is a way in which offspring end up resembling their parents with respect to their licking behaviors. Is it a biological mechanism? Is it a social mechanism? Well, it's both. It's both because it's a behavior of the mother rat it's in that sense a social interaction that explains the altered response to stress, but it's also plainly biological in the banal sense that it's regulated by biochemical features. So it's very unclear how we're even supposed to draw this line between the biological bits of epigenetics and the social bits of epigenetics. But then the problem is that if in safeguarding the germline, we're concerned to safeguard those processes which, as you'll recall the OED says, assure the transfer of inherited traits from one generation to the next, then we'll end up trying to safeguard or place a moratoria on every single one of this huge, unwieldy forest of processes, including processes of social learning. And what that means is that the very concept of the germline ends up just stretching to breaking point here in the light of epigenetic research. It's just not a useful concept anymore. So I just tried to 
illustrate a kind of scientific case against the value of the germline for ethical thinking. I also want to try and suggest that there's a kind of ethical case against the value of the germline for ethical thinking. But you'll see that in the end, this is trading on rather similar considerations. So why is it that groups have been so concerned about intervening in the germline? What's supposed to be the ethical problem here? Remember back in April, the NIH suggested that intervening in the germline was deeply problematic. Why did they say it was deeply problematic? Here's what they said in April. They said these arguments against germline modifications include the serious non-quantifiable safety issues, ethical issues presented by altering the germline in a way that affects the next generation without their consent, and a current lack of compelling medical applications justifying the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in embryos. This statement from the NIH is fairly typical of, I think, three general arguments which are often raised against germline modification. First of all, people say germline interventions can have multi-generational effects. And of course, they can. They can have effects that don't just affect children, they affect children's children, and so forth. People then say, partly because of this, that the people that these interventions will affect cannot give their consent. Because these interventions will affect your children, and maybe even their children, those people don't even exist yet to give their consent to these interventions. And also, these interventions are often not perfectly understood. There may be considerable uncertainty around them. And that uncertainty includes the scope for harm to be done to children. Now, it seems to me that these three considerations do indeed arise in the context of what people want to protect when they're thinking about germline modifications. But these three considerations cannot possibly show by themselves that germline modifications are objectionable. Why not? Because these three considerations also arise in many, many contexts which we think are completely unobjectionable. Town planning, for example. Town planning is an activity which can have multi-generational effects as we destroy certain areas of towns, build other ones, decide that people are going to live in high-rise buildings rather than low-rise buildings. The people that these interventions will affect, once again, cannot consent to them, evidently, because town planning decisions will often have a 30, 40, 50-year horizon, maybe even longer than that and so it will affect children and, and grandchildren. And town planning interventions are also often not well understood. Exactly what social differences, and thereby exactly what health differences, particular decisions to, to rehouse people, to flatten certain areas of town, to build new areas of town, to introduce certain kinds of styles of building, exactly what the health interventions, uh, implications of those might be, is also often not perfectly understood. And in a way, it's not that surprising, because as I said earlier on, the whole worry about epigenetics is that it has this rather sprawling kind of, of way of being understood. And, and of course, on some definitions of epigenetics, town planning would also be understood precisely as an epigenetic process, because it affects the ways in which offspring resemble their parents, and it's not rooted in genes or DNA. So it can't be the case that any intervention that triggers these three concerns must be objectionable. Because we don't try to ban, ban town planning. Instead, we think it's an important thing to do. How do we handle it instead? We think that risks should be evaluated in a responsible way. And that maybe gives us some clues about how we should think about the ethics of new reproductive technologies. Now, in suggesting that we need to evaluate risks in a responsible way, what I'm absolutely not suggesting is that the right course of action in the context of technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 or mitochondrial donation should simply follow some kind of strictly technical scientific risk assessment. In fact, I'll argue against that uh, quite strongly uh, in a moment. <clears throat> As you'll see, mitochondrial donation, genome editing, raise a variety of issues that are not well handled by a strict 
scientific risk assessment. Those include issues around the value of genetic parenthood, the existence and significance of clear lines between what we might think of as treatment on the one hand and enhancement beyond what's required for health on another, and also the risk that, particularly in the case of something like CRISPR-Cas9, the precision that these techniques appear to promise to parents may actually give them an illusory sense of control, an over-exaggerated understanding of the prospects that their children's lives will have based on their genes, and that that might encourage a kind of very objectionable, technologically aided form of, of pushy parenting. Now, just on this, uh, a small digression. People usually worry that the problem here is going to be that people will, will, will want the best for their children and will push them into areas to which they're genetically unsuited. Now, uh, there's, a, there's been a, Anthony actually sent me, uh, Anthony Ung sent me this, this uh, a few months ago, um, uh, an extraordinary expression and, and an objectionable expression, I think, of a, of a form of, of genetic determinism. So this was a headline from the South China Morning Post, uh, from a couple of months ago, Hong Kong has looked at gene tests to tell whether they'll be better at Chinese or prone to an illness. Now, what was particularly striking here was a quotation from a mother who'd used this genetic testing service. Zhou Yu Menyi, I'm sorry for my appalling pronunciation, a 38-year-old mother of three recently used, I don't know how you say this, Le Jean, to examine the DNA of her seven-year-old daughter, Jamie, to find out what talents she would have. We found out that she doesn't have the genes for sports or muscle, muscle growth, Yu says, so we're not pushing her to do sports or play musical instruments which require precise muscle movements. Now, this is, I, I think, a rather kind of frightening example of how these technologies can be misunderstood, potentially in rather adverse ways. What does it mean to say there's a gene for sports? Well, the best it means is that there's a gene, there's a piece of DNA, that has a reasonably decent statistical association, albeit probably far from perfect, with elevated sporting abilities. And that's all it means. It doesn't mean that the only way you'll be good at sport is if you've got the gene. It doesn't mean that if you don't have the gene, you'll be bad at sport. It's a purely probabilistic assessment. In that sense, it makes just as much sense to talk about environments for sporting ability, where we simply mean, once again, if you're in this environment, there is a statistically raised chance of you being better at sports. So in that sense, being raised at high altitude is an environment for long distance running. Going to an English private school is an environment for cricket playing. But of course, it would be crazy to say, oh, well, you know, Fred didn't have an environment for cricket playing, so we're not going to encourage him down that route. It's obvious that that would be a silly thing to say in the environmental context. If Fred wants to play cricket and is showing talents at it, let him do it, regardless of whether or not he happens to have been at an English public school, which may be an environment for cricket playing. OK, uh, rant against genetic determinism uh, now over. Um, let me return now to these issues about risk. In recent regulatory thinking about risk, particularly in the context of environmental policy, but also, I think, in the context of policy around health, in Europe, and also maybe in other places as well, it's often said that we need to appeal to something called the precautionary principle. And this is a, a principle that is often thought to be especially useful in just the kinds of situations like the mitochondrial donation case, in just the kind of situations like the CRISPR-Cas9 case, where we're dealing with technologies that potentially have benefit, but because they're not perfectly well understood, uh, and, and because they also may have significant adverse effect on health because of unforeseen side effects, uh, present us with, with significant problems. Now, informally, the way that some people will often explain the precautionary principle it goes something like this. If we're uncertain about the effects of our actions, perhaps uncertain about legalizing new technologies, and when there's a possibility that those actions will have grave consequences, you should be better safe than sorry, or you should maybe err on the side of caution. Now, that's a very informal way of understanding the precautionary principle. What does it really mean in practice? Here's a really bad way of understanding 
exactly what the precautionary principle is supposed to tell us. So suppose we think the precautionary principle says something like this. Whenever there's a proposed course of action which carries potential for serious harm, it doesn't matter if there isn't strong evidence that it will really cause harm, and it doesn't even matter if most evidence suggests it won't cause harm, as long as there's just that potential or small probability, then we should simply ban that course of action. Now, that's a, a, a bad way of understanding the precautionary principle because CRISPR hasn't been tested on humans, so there is, of course, some small probability that it will cause damage. Mitochondrial donation hasn't yet been used on humans, so there's some small probability that it might have unforeseen side effects. So this would lead to us banning CRISPR and banning mitochondrial donation, but of course it'll lead to us banning everything. It'll lead to us banning all new drugs because it doesn't matter how much you've tested a new drug, there's always some possibility that there's a side effect that you've missed. There's always some possibility that adverse events have gone unreported, but they're there all the same. So one worry here is that this way of understanding the precautionary principle, the PP as I'm calling it here, is completely stultifying. This is why many people have said the precautionary principle is anti-technology, and this is why many people have opposed it. Now that's not quite right. It's nearly right, but it's not quite right. The precautionary principle understood in this extreme way isn't anti-technology, it's just incoherent because it simultaneously prohibits new drugs while also mandating new drugs. It prohibits them because if we were to allow new drugs to be used, there would be a small probability of serious harm caused by that decision through unforeseen side effects. But of course, if we were to not allow new drugs to be used, there would also be a probability, maybe a small one, maybe a large one, who knows, of unforeseen of, of harm because people who would otherwise have benefited from those drugs won't be able to get access to them. The same can be said of CRISPR. CRISPR has potential for causing harm. It also has potential for causing good. And so it looks as though this version of the precautionary principle is going to end up being incoherent because it's going to simultaneously tell us that we must do something because otherwise the costs of inaction will be very high while also telling us not to do something because the potential costs of action are very high too. So that version won't work. I don't think it follows that we should simply reject all precautionary insights. So my first way into this is just to look at one of the most famous statements of the precautionary principle. Uh, and this comes uh, in the context of environmental regulation, but the recipe it gives us can also work in, in any other context. So this is principle 15 of, of the so-called Rio Declaration from 1992, I think. And here's what it says. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent, in this case, environmental degradation, but one might also think about uh, damage to human health here as well. I think this is a perfectly sensible version of the precautionary principle, partly because it insists that whatever action we take needs to be cost effective, and so it doesn't simply suggest that we should institute any old risk reducing measure regardless of how expensive it might be, regardless of what its consequences might be, and it also reminds us that we shouldn't use the argument that, oh, we don't yet have full knowledge, to stand in the way of effective regulation. Because of that, I think that sometimes this way of understanding the precautionary principle will lead us to limit the use of new technologies. Sometimes it will actually lead us to encourage the new use of new technologies. So for example, if you're getting very, very positive results from a, a clinical trial, what this suggests is lack of full scientific uncertainty shan't be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures. In other words, the mere fact that we're not yet scientifically certain of the value of the drug shouldn't stand in the way of allowing it to be used more widely, albeit under proper supervision, even maybe when the, the normal trialing regime hasn't finished yet. And that's exactly the way in which some people think clinical trials should be used, that when the signal coming from them is very, very strong, it's an indulgence to carry on the trial for longer. 
What kind of lessons do I think we can glean from a precautionary approach? Let me just run through a few of them rather quickly, and then, and then I'll, I'll talk about some particular lessons that I think are important in a little more detail. Precautionary thinking always reminds us that scientific research is fallible, that we may not have got the right answers, and that our scientific assessments may have made mistakes. It reminds us that we need to consider the costs of making those mistakes. Suppose you've got it wrong. How bad would that be? And we need to think about different types of mistakes here. Because of that, precautionary thinking always tends to advocate that regulation should be reversible when possible. That's for the simple reason that if you are indeed mindful of fallibility, it makes sense to institute regulations that you can undo if you realize that they were predicated on some kind of mistake. So reversibility is always beneficial. And lack of full scientific knowledge always reminds us that we need to remedy our ignorance as far as possible, often by allowing limited use of new technologies to begin with, under very close monitoring, with very thorough systems for reporting adverse events, and a kind of gradual expansion of those new technologies to broader and broader public, but broader and broader population groups as our uncertainty is reduced. Precautionary thinking also reminds us that we need to think in very diverse ways, in the most thorough ways we can, about costs and benefits of new technologies, including, once again, new reproductive technologies. We need to think using rigorous research, which will often come from psychology, will often come from social science, not just about clinical side effects of new reproductive technologies, but also about how those technologies are likely to affect the well-being of future children, how they're likely to challenge traditional family structures, and how bad it would be if family structures were challenged in those ways. We need to consider exactly what form of good these new technologies bring, and we need to think about whether there might be alternative means to those same ends. And the mitochondrial case is an interesting one here. And that's because nobody has really suggested or tried to suggest that the mitochondrial donation technologies that I was talking about give people suffering from the disease a cure. They don't. If you are a mother affected by mitochondrial disease, these donation technologies won't make you better. Instead, they give you a certain kind of new ability with respect to having children. But of course, they're also not the only way in which disease sufferers can have healthy children. There are already ways for sufferers from mitochondrial disease to have healthy children. They can adopt those children, or they can simply use egg donation and then have those eggs fertilized maybe by their own partner's sperm. So if we push on the issue exactly what is the benefit that these technologies bring, the answer is that they allow people who otherwise would not have done to have a particular type of genetic link with their children. They allow people to have a, a link mediated by their nuclear genetic material. That is the primary benefit of these technologies. And it seems to me that we can't evaluate the positive and negative aspects of these technologies without thinking in some detail about exactly what benefit there is to having this nuclear genetic link. And this immediately means that we need to think about questions uh, to do with you know, whether or not that there are reasons for thinking that children uh, born in this kind of way have higher levels of well-being than others, whether or not the reasons that parents give for wanting this kind of link uh, are, are valid and so forth. Now, uh, this is not the final slide, but this is the final point that I want to make. Um, and it's to do with the relationship between scientific assessment and ethical assessment. Sometimes, governments, 
when they're considering new reproductive technologies, and not just new reproductive technologies, many kinds of technology, sometimes governments are very, very thorough in their desire to ensure that not just scientific technical issues are evaluated, but ethical issues are evaluated as well. And that's very laudable. But the way in which they do this often presupposes a very strong demarcation of labor. We'll set one group primarily of scientific specialists to work on understanding the scientific issues. We'll set another group to work, maybe comprising ethical specialists, maybe some scientists too, to look at the ethical issues. We can give many examples of this. The mitochondrial donation case is a good example. So the UK government asked something called the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority to conduct a scientific review of the safety and efficacy of mitochondrial replacement techniques. The HFEA got the science job. And the HFEA said, although not within the scope of this review, it's important to note that issues other than purely scientific need also to be considered. In other words, by implication, the HFEA is saying there are important scientific issues, there are important ethical issues, but we are dealing with purely scientific ones. Someone else is going to handle the ethics. Who handled the ethics? The Nuffield Council on Bioethics handled the ethics, and I was a member of the working party that produced that Nuffield Council on Bioethics report. So as I've said, this whole way of dividing up the work assumes that there's a clear distinction between purely scientific issues on the one hand and issues around ethics, public attitudes, and so forth on the other. Again, in the HFEA's review, we find this. This review focuses exclusively on the science and the safety and effectiveness of these techniques. It does not consider the ethical and legal issues that are raised by such techniques. And implicitly, if not explicitly, the Nuffield Council kind of reciprocated here. So the HFEA says, OK, you folk at the Nuffield Council, you can do the ethics, we'll do the science. The Nuffield Council said something rather similar by implication in the way that it, it drew its main conclusion. We believe that if these, moral, if, sorry, if these novel techniques are adequately proven to be acceptably safe and effective as treatments, it would be ethical for families to use them if they wish to do so and have been offered an appropriate level of information and support. In other words, if the HFEA does its job properly and gives it the thumbs up, then we're happy with the remaining ethical issues. But is it really plausible that questions about adequate proof, questions about acceptable safety, really are purely scientific questions that can be handled by a scientific committee and which have no ethical or legal implications or suppositions. It seems to me that that's unlikely. I actually think the HFEA report is rather good. I'm not really finding fault with the HFEA report here, although what I do want to suggest is that the HFEA report cannot really claim to be entirely free of ethics. So the HFEA claimed that pronuclear transfer and maternal spindle transfer were better, superior to existing techniques which already held possibilities of controlling mitochondrial disease. So what are those alternatives, those techniques that we already had? One of them uses something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. You look at an embryo produced by a mother with mitochondrial disease and you see whether or not some of those embryos may have low levels of what I'm going to call here faulty mitochondria. And if they've got low levels of faulty mitochondria, you simply use that embryo for reimplantation into the womb on the grounds that probably then the resulting child will be free of these mitochondrial diseases. But the HFEA says there's a problem with this. PGD might not be a bad technique, but it's not going to be perfect because even if a mother with mitochondrial disease uses PGD to have a healthy child, because of the rather peculiar way in which mitochondria are involved in reproduction, it's possible that the mother's own child, even if she's healthy, may have eggs 
which end up with much higher levels of unhealthy mitochondria. So her kids may be affected by mitochondrial disease. So why did the HFEA report like MST and PST? Why did it prefer it to PGD? Because MST and PST, sorry, PNT, the HFEA report says, offer the prospect of eliminating and not just reducing the risk of disease due to mitochondrial DNA mutations. But then actually, a little bit later in the report, the HFEA says, oh, oh do you know what? Actually, even PNT and MST don't fully eliminate these risks. There is still some risk left. They, in fact, suggest that maybe the best thing is if, once again, a healthy girl born using MST or PNT, she could actually still have her own eggs with a slightly higher level of unhealthy mitochondria. So what should happen? Well, the HFEA says we should use PGD. PGD could assess the health of the mother who's affected with diseases, daughter's own eggs, or rather own embryos. And then they say this combination of PNT or MST with PGD would guarantee that subsequent generations would be free from the disease. Now, hold that thought, because I'll come back to that in a minute. Some commentators made the following suggestion. They said, maybe we should use PNT and MST, maybe they're great technologies, but we're not quite certain about how they're going to work in humans. So maybe it would be a good idea to use PGD in order to figure out which embryos are male and which embryos are female. And we should only, to begin with, re-implant the male embryos, because remember, if you were listening really carefully, I told you at the beginning that mitochondrial disease is only passed from females onto their children, not from males. And males do not pass their mitochondria on at all during reproduction. So in other words, if we use PGD to only re-implant the male offspring, then worries about uncontrolled inheritance through the generations would be closed off because it's only the girls who have that long-lasting mitochondrial inheritance. It would be a kind of precautionary measure. So this would remove worries about long-lasting effects from unanticipated mistakes. That was a suggestion that had been made at the time. What did the HFEA say about it? Long quotation, but I think it's interesting. The panel did not support this idea did not support any proposal to select only male embryos for transfer after MST or PNT, even though this would avoid these issues as well as circumvent objections made by some that the methods are a form of germline genetic alteration. Remember, we've talked about that already. Selecting only XY embryos for transfer, only male embryos for transfer, would require PGD, an additional step that's likely to compromise early development of already manipulated embryos. Moreover, it would on average immediately reduce by half the number of embryos available for transfer. This would decrease the efficiency of the techniques and make it likely that patients would have to undergo repeated cycles of treatment. Is this all just purely technical? It's technical, but is it purely technical? Did the HFEA take a consistent view here? Because after all, they say, you need to use PGD with MST and PNT on one page, and then a couple of pages later they say, don't, whatever you do, use PGD with MST and PNT. Is this a consistent position? Yes, it's perfectly consistent. But it makes best sense if we think that the HFEA took the view that worries about interfering in the germline really were not very weighty worries at all. And so, therefore, worries about the additional step involved using PGD could simply be dismissed. We shouldn't bother with PGD in this context because it's an answer to a problem that doesn't matter that much. On the other hand, the HFEA took the view that benefits that might arise not just from elimination but from permanent elimination of faulty mitochondria would be much more important. The HFEA's view is consistent. It may even be the right view, but it's not a purely scientific view. It's a view which I think is informed by an implicit stance on the moral weight associated with germline intervention. 
It seems to me that questions about assessment of safety and efficacy of new technologies, although they're sometimes described in purely scientific terms, are not purely technical matters. And it seems to me, because of that, that we should be careful about restricting advisory panels to a membership that consists purely of scientists who work with these technologies. It is indeed absolutely essential that they contain those people, but it's not clear to me that they should contain only those people. The HFEA report makes a, an important insight. It says, from a medical or scientific point of view, all novel treatments pose essentially the same question. When is a treatment safe to offer? And it seems to me that the question, the difficult question that the HFEA tried to wrangle with here, how much evidence do we need before we say that a technology is safe enough to offer? That question turns on how valuable you think the benefits are of the technology and how worrying you think the costs are of the technology. If you think it's very, very important that mothers can have nuclear genetic links with their children, then you may well think, OK, enough now. We've done enough work. It's time, finally, to get these technologies into the medical market. If instead you think that having a nuclear genetic linkage is a trivial benefit, then instead you might say, it's not good enough. We should do more experimentation. We should wait for more data. It seems to me that these questions about how much data are required are simultaneously scientific and ethical. But they're among the most important questions that we face when we think about the ethics of new technologies. The risk with dividing labor between the scientific assessment and the ethical assessment is that even though that often flows from very, very good intentions to make sure that all of the issues are being covered, questions about the acceptability of risk get ignored. And they get ignored because Ethical committees assume the scientists are dealing with it. Scientific committees assume the ethicists are dealing with it. And in fact, nobody quite discusses those questions in as much detail as they ought. So for that reason, it seems to me that division of labor is something that needs to be opposed in this area. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you, Professor Lewins. Um, I think we do have time for a number of questions. So um, <clears throat> if you have a question, I would just ask that you uh, use one of the microphones that are being passed around. Um, let us know your name, and your affiliation, if you're minded to do so, and ask your question. I also ask that you keep it short. Professor Lewins uh, and I would especially welcome questions from students. So don't be afraid. Put up your hand. Professor Lewins, a fantastic talk. Uh, my name is Zan Marwa. I'm a barrister at Guild Chambers here in Hong Kong. You raised a, a lot of very interesting issues, but as a family lawyer, what I found particularly interesting was this question of multiple gamete donors beyond the normal two. Mm. And if DNA is coming from more than one mother, particularly in an environment like the United Kingdom where you have uh, the possibility of same-sex marriages, mm. uh, it's possible that the that there are, in fact, three parents. In Hong Kong, our legislation isn't really drafted with this problem in mind. And applied, well, my, my reading of it at currently would be that there would be two mothers and a father. That seems to me to raise ethical questions, and I'd be interested to hear what you had to say about that. Yeah, um, I, could, I could go on at length about this. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, 
this is a technology that was widely described in the UK at the time as three parent IVF. Uh, in fact, so much so that usually if you want to explain to someone what the technology is, you just say, oh, you remember that thing that everybody called three parent IVF at the time? And they go, oh, yes. Um, that label um, generated a lot of discussion uh, and also raised issues around ethics, as you say. Um, let me just say a couple of things. Um, legally, uh, the, legally, actually, this is one case where the answer is very, very clear. Uh, in the UK legal situation, it is very clear that although there are three biological contributors to the embryo, including two female contributors, uh, there is only one mother. And it's, it's very clear that the mother just is the person who gives birth to the baby. So the mitochondrial donor, as I said, really the donor of everything bar the nuclear material, is clearly, legally speaking, not the mother. Um, I think that there are, I mean, in terms of kind of further ethical questions, one obvious ethical question to raise is how are the kids going to feel under these circumstances when they grow up and regardless of what the law says, people might say, you know, you're a freak because you've only got three, because you've got three parents and everybody else has only got two. Um, interesting research on the, the welfare of children um, born through kind of unusual technologically facilitated forms of reproduction actually seems to suggest that by and large, as long as they know what happened, they're just fine with it. It doesn't actually make that much difference to the child's welfare. Unless, of course, the root is that the kid is bullied at school or something like that. But there's a sense in which that's not a problem with the technology. That's a problem with the way in which the technology is accepted or understood. Um, the only other thing I'll say, um, people really complained a lot, actually, at the time, particularly on the medical side, that the three-parent IVF label was deeply misleading. As I say, legally speaking, it certainly was misleading because legally there would only be two parents. Um, people also said biologically it's highly misleading uh, because, uh, and it's true, that the donor mother only contributes a tiny, tiny fraction of, of the genome. Um, I, I agree with all that. At the same time, it seems to me that our notions of what it means to be a parent, including our notions of what it means to be a biological parent, actually turn out to be fairly flexible under these circumstances. So you can imagine, uh, you can imagine a, a, a lesbian couple, for example, where both women may want to have some kind of biological role, um, and uh, you know, one of them supplies the uh, egg minus nucleus, the other supplies the nucleus. Um, the, 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 the egg is then, uh, is then fertilized. And under those circumstances, it, it seems to me it would be a bit odd to say to the child, you know, you say you've got two mums, but you don't really. It seems to me that there we have kind of flexible notions of parentage and, and we should simply just allow that to, to go. Tracy. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Tracy Chan, the National University of Singapore. Um, I agree essentially with you that the a core value that will have to be evaluated is the value of genetic parenthood. Because conventional IVF would give them healthy children through donated oocytes. So really what they're looking for is the genetic connection. Now, I also suspect, however, that we're not going to come to some easy consensus on what the value of genetic parenthood is. So in the context of a likely contestation about, well, how important is this to them and therefore how do we evaluate the risks, um, what would you say to the, the argument that really we should let the parents decide whether the precautionary principle is satisfied? Mm. So it's a question of, well, who should have the decision-making authority to decide if the costs and benefits in the light of the risks uh, are worthwhile. And I understand in the UK that the, the, the parents who have been pushing for this have really said we should be the ones to decide if it's safe enough. Yeah, so just wondering what your thoughts were on that. That's a really good question. Um, I, I wish I had a um, similarly good answer. Um, I, I think a lot of the time um, th this issue gets ducked. Um, and sometimes it gets ducked actually precisely because of what, what you've already said. It, it's It's viewed as um, 
very contentious. The, the other problem is that it is an issue that is not doesn't just arise in the context of, of mitochondrial donation. There's a sense in which very much of the history of reproductive technology has been about giving people a, an ability to have genetically related children who, who otherwise wouldn't have done so. Um, so, I mean, one, one thing to say here is that, and this, this I think, and I was, as I say, I was involved in the Nuffield Council report. Um, one aspect of, of the Nuffield Council report um, was that we, we basically said something like, we've got narrow terms of reference. These issues have scope way beyond our narrow terms of reference, so we're not going to open up this particular box too much. Now, I think in some ways that's a really good example of how technological uh, regulation is quite profoundly um, affected sometimes by apparently incidental initial decisions on exactly what the terms of reference of some group should be. Um, I mean, I, trying, to, trying to move on, on to your question, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly suspicious of simply leaving evaluation up to parents. Um, and, and the reason is because it seems to me that you wouldn't want to set a precedent for the notion that the domain of reproduction is purely a matter of self-expression. No other agency should really have uh, any oversight in that kind of area. And so when it comes to making use of whatever biological resources they can get their hands on, leave the cost-benefit evaluation up to the parents. That's a strong enough position that by itself, it would, by parallel reasoning, lead you to think that uh, untrammeled forms of genetic enhancement should be allowed simply as a means of parents to express themselves, regardless of the, the cost-benefit analysis, it seems to me. Um, so I guess the short answer is, I very much understand why you make that proposal. It is a contentious issue. It's not one that I see being resolved very easily. But at the same time, I probably would be worried about going quite to the sort of um, consumerist extreme that, that you're hinting at there. Hi, um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, Professor Lewins. My, my name is Chris Hui, Hong Kong University. I'm a clinician by training. As a respiratory doctor, I'm a little bit further away from the reproductive mm -hmm. field. But really what I'd like to invite you to comment on is the chain of, of decision making that we're talking about. I mean, you go back to the beginning and we, we're discussing the, the, the value that, you know, assuming we can resolve the question of value ascribed to genetic continuity, the next step is the uh, decision and the assessment of the value of the actual technology itself. And you've highlighted the problems presented by division of labor and the ethics versus the science, which we all face in different branches of mm -hmm. medicine for different novel therapies. Can I invite you to comment then on the consequences of the, the, the application of that decision further downstream? So assuming we come to a consensus, what about the slippery slope argument that says, well, you've made your decision, you've set the benchmark. But how do we know that the application then is going to be consistent with what the panel has intended and is not then sort of maligned further down the line? I, I, I'll cite a simple example. To my mind, there's nothing to stop us from sequentially applying MST, PNT in sequence over two or three generations in order to achieve the objective of completely eradicating sort of abnormal mm -hmm. mitochondria. Um, yeah, well, um, OK. Uh, again, a good. Um... Good question. These slippery slope issues are uh, ab absolutely um, worries that um, were voiced uh, during debates ar around the, the mitochondrial um, debate. Um, again, there's, there's a lot I could say about that. Um, the first thing to say is that, strictly speaking, I think that there are worries about the very idea of a slippery slope. Because a slope has a particular direction, it has a particular line of travel. Now, what's really going on here is that we find a series of technologies, none of which has any decisive ethical difference-making feature from any other one. So uh, 
if you're worried that mitochondrial donation is a step towards um, nuclear genome editing, then you'll say mitochondrial donation is a slippery slope in that, is on the slippery slope in that direction. But then you could also say the same thing. You know, once we allow IVF in general, then that's also one of the steps uh, along that pathway. And and you'll never find um, a clear line that says, okay, this is the obvious place to stop. Go no further. That's precisely why it's called a slippery slope. But there's a sense in which it, it's more a frictionless plane than a slippery slope. You can push these arguments around in more or less any direction that you like. You can say, because there's no, uh, I mean, one can indeed say, because there is no decisive ethical difference, then what are you going to do? Are you going to tell us we should never have allowed IVF? What are you going to do? Are you going to say that you know, we should never have made any steps along, along, along this technical route? Um, having said that, I, I do think that um, it is really very, very difficult to see how the precedent set in the mitochondrial case can really be resisted in other cases. There's one very, very clear reason why that is. People who suffer from mitochondrial disease sometimes suffer from those diseases because their mitochondrial genes are defective. Sometimes they suffer from very similar diseases because the nuclear genes that communicate with the mitochondria are defective but there's nothing wrong with the mitochondrial genes themselves. Now, once we decide that we think it's a good thing for mitochondrial diseases to be eliminated, if somebody then comes along with a CRISPR-Cas9 technology and they say, we can modify the nuclear genome such that the very same or very similar <coughs> mitochondrial diseases will be eradicated, if the risk-benefit profile is similar to the one that we've already shown for the PNT and MST cases, it is very, very hard to see how, how people will hold off there, it seems to me. It, it seems it's pretty much irresistible that, that those technologies coming at some stage. May I follow up on that point? Yeah. Um, it seems to me that the HFEA uh, picked upon precisely the most radical um, form of treatment to authorize when it allowed mitochondrial uh, <clears throat> donation because that is truly permanently, purely germline. That would not be so in uh, nu uh, nuclear genome editing, because nature will correct that. It is halved and shuffled at every generation. So once you allow the mitochondrial um, donation, your arguments in principle are going to be considerab considerably weakened when it comes to the defense of nuclear genome editing. So uh, how, how do you then That's deal with yeah. this? Yeah. That's a really interesting point. I mean, I, I, I can absolutely see your line of argument there. Um, the reason why I find it interesting is because it's, uh, although what you've said is perfectly sensible, it's the exact opposite to the way that most people thought about these things. So, so, so various um, heroic individuals in, in, in the UK at the time, in, including um, some fairly prominent parliamentarians in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, said, oh, you know, the mitochondrial, uh, these mitochondrial technologies, they've got nothing to do with, uh, with germline intervention. Um, so far, far from the idea that, that they're a um, stronger form, they said it's got nothing to do with germline intervention at all. Why? Well, then, because they just simply said rather implausibly and with no good reason, uh, oh, we know that germline intervention just means intervention on the nuclear genome. Um, I'm not sure that the, the difference that you're pointing to is quite as strong as you're suggesting. I mean, partly because, uh, as I kind of indicated, even the, mito the mitochondrial genome itself is subject to mutation. It's subject to a, actually a particularly extreme um, form of, of mutation, if, if you like, which occurs because during uh, reproduction, there's a very, very large population of mitochondria within a cell and actually a very small number of those are then uh, used when the cell reproduces. Now what that means is that because of basically the fact that a small sample from a large population can always be statistically highly abnormal compared to the population, what this means is that in actual fact, the way that reproduction works means that the inherited mitochondria can often be really rather different um, mm. to the parental ones, which is exactly the reason why uh, the HFEA admitted that, in fact, PNT and MST by themselves 
won't actually fully assure the yes. elimination of these diseases across several generations. They will simply make it much more likely. Can the argument be, well, my argument be for, further bolstered by pointing out that it's not just mitochondria that's being transferred. You don't know what else yeah. you're transferring. And we, we now know that um, epigenetics is pointing out to the yeah. effects of uh, herit her heritable characteristics through proteins yes. in no, the I'm cell. With, yes, uh, that's right. And I, I, that, that, is, that is something that I uh, <clears throat> worried about. That's something that I tried to hint at right at the beginning, precisely through this worry um, uh, about the, the way in which the label of mitochondrial donation I actually agree there that, that the label makes the technology sound less controversial than it may be, precisely because the label distracts us from this area of uncertainty about other aspects of cellular or cytoplasmic inheritance that may fall outside the strict mitochondrial genome. I agree with that. Sorry, we have time for one last question. Uh, Professor, my name is Nicholas Miller. I'm a solicitor in Hong Kong. I'm conscious that my question, my angle, is trying to put the genie back in the bottle. But do you personally think the development since Patrick Stepto in Oldham in 75 to 78 and Louise Brown are positive and good um, with all the, tech, not just the technological issues, but the ethical issues that have been touched on in the context of the world that where the one thing humanity does not have a problem with is fertility. And my concern about IVF and everything else is that there is a huge concentration on a relatively small number of people who cannot naturally uh, reproduce. And then we've morphed into those people or others uh, creating, forgive me for use of the term, but perfect babies. Are you personally in favor of the way it's gone? Um, there have been uh, some instances of very bad practice associated with IVF, um, particularly in cases, I think, where uh, far more embryos have been chosen for reimplantation than I think is uh, responsible. Um, I wouldn't go so far, though, as to link the IVF issue quite so strongly with issues around global population expansion. Um, I mean, for the obvious reason that it's not IVF that's generally driving global population expansion. Um, of course, in a slightly more oblique way, and, and, and here I'm, I'm aware that I'm, I'm as guilty of this as, as, as anybody. Um, I, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, so I, I, certainly, I certainly wouldn't want to say uh, the problem with IVF is that there are enough people anyway, we shouldn't be making the situation worse. Because it seems to me that that's just not really the right way to think about the consequences of IVF. IVF will have made a, a negligible difference uh, in, terms of, in terms of overall, overall population expansion. Um, as I say, I do think there are very good reasons, sometimes based on, on considerations of, of, of welfare of, of children, sometimes actually considerations of welfare of parents themselves, to, to restrict the number of children that people can have through IVF to, uh, to one uh, or maybe two um, at a time. Um, This does raise a, a kind of broader global issue, though, which is, uh, and, and here I worry that I'm sort of contributing to this myself. Um, people who work on bioethics, like me, often get very interested in questions around new technologies. Um, and there's a sense in which often that's distracting our ethical attention from other issues that are, in a way, much, of much more consequence. So issues around. Uh, global inequalities in health, for example, which are much better treated by thinking in ways about the ethics of public health interventions, for example, rather than thinking directly about new technologies which are likely to be of benefit to fairly small numbers of wealthy people, uh, much more than they're of benefit to, to, to large numbers of poor people who simply won't get access to many of these technologies. So that's a very oblique way of answering the question. Well, I think um, it's time for me to close the Q&A session. Um, I think we all had had a very fruitful evening. It remains for me to first thank you for being patient and sitting through this uh, lecture.
and to thank also um, our president and vice chancellor, Professor Mettison and Dr. Christina Mettison. And of course, would you please join me in thanking our um, guests for the evening, Professor Tim Lewins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a bus waiting for invited guests. Um, if you will just uh, identify yourselves to, to the, our <clears throat> colleagues outside, then we'll take you down to the bus. Thank you. <clears throat>